Too many parents these days are facing the shock and the trauma that our guests today have both encountered. In fact, Josie and Dee have children who say they trans identify. This change in gender identity does not only affect the child, it sends a shock wave into the heart of the entire family. That's what we'll talk about today with Dee and Josie on today's program. Welcome to the Moms for America podcast. Each week, special guests tackle the issues facing the moms of America today. Discussions include personal stories and advice on how moms can build a strong foundation of faith, family, and freedom in their homes and country. Hi, moms. I'm Debbie Kurlitis, your host, and thank you once again for joining us on the podcast. We love our mamas. Already here on the top of the show, I do want to invite all of our moms to like, subscribe, and share our podcast, right? We must remind you every time about this. And we also want to ask you to share this podcast. Woo! What a podcast today. Um, what a tough t- subject to be addressing, but it's so, so important. Again, share this with your mama friends in your circles. Also, I do want to uh, invite all of our moms to join the Moms for America movement. Uh, moms for America is a powerful group of moms. We are uniting all across the country and we are fighting for our families. We're fighting for our faith, our freedom, and the constitution. So please go ahead and check us out at momsforamerica.us. Join the movement, join the support group, join the mamas. Uh, We are here for you and helping you in your journey through motherhood. Also, if you have any topics or ideas or any feedback that you'd like to send me, would you send them, email me, I should say, at podcast at momsteramerica.net. I would absolutely love to hear from you. I so appreciate your feedback and suggestions. Well, on to today's program. Today, Josie Armstrong and Dee Schumacher are my guests. Josie and Dee are not their real names. For those of you that are watching the podcast, you'll notice that their faces are not visible either. Josie and Dee are keeping their identities secret because they're engaged in a battle to save their kids. They're fighting back against the new gender ideology as the only correct belief system. They're fighting back against the gender affirming care as the only legitimate approach to gender confusion. That puts them in the crosshairs of everyone. So in a way, they're fighting underground. They're both part of the Substack group called PIT, Parents with Inconvenient Truths About Trans. The group has just published a book of the same title. It contains many stories from parents who are in the battle to save their children from the aggressive transgender movement. Well, welcome, Josie and Dee, to the Moms for America podcast. We are so glad to have both of you. I know this is a tough subject, um, but I just want to say thanks for coming. Uh, We really appreciate you guys. Thanks for having us. All right, ladies. um, Could we hear a little bit about your family, your two mamas uh, that love their kids, and just kind of get to know you a little bit? Uh, introduce us to a little bit about your tribe, uh, each of you, if you don't mind. Uh, sure, I'll go first. Um, married for about 27 years and with two beautiful daughters, both of whom we adopted from China, uh, one in 2005 and one in 2010. Wonderful. And um, I'm married. Uh, I have one son who is the trans identified son he's 19. um i live in california and he has been trans identified since he was 15. wow now as i talk with both of you we obviously know that you need to be anonymous um And obviously respecting that, still appreciating so much that you're chatting with us and and sharing these stories and talking about the book. Why the need to be anonymous? Um, Well, first of all, if I um, made myself public, it would probably jeopardize the tenuous relationship I have with my trans-identified daughter, who's also 19 years old. It's very important to maintain the love connection at all costs. And so 
Um, I have to be very careful. You know, I've been flying under the radar in my house for almost four years. Sure. And, and I, I guess she hasn't figured it out because kids don't care what their parents do during the day. Um, but I'm also an attorney and um, we're in the Carolinas, but uh, close to the Charlotte area, which is a very progressive city. And so, you know, reputationally, it could impact my standing in the community mm -hmm. to come out about this, even though I've been a lifelong Democrat, you know, I'm, I'm what you might call a liberal. Um, and uh, and so it can be very dangerous um, to do something like that. So sad to say, right, that it could be dangerous just yeah. to share your story. Yeah. Uh, Josie? Well, I I live in a huge city, um, very progressive also, and I worry about losing my job. And I worry about my son finding out who um, he has been. Uh, he has been um, estranged from us for a year. And I worry that he would see this or a friend of his would see it and I would never get that connection back. So, um, most of the parents that will talk, um, and show their face have, um, their kids have desisted. So they okay. feel confident that it won't harm their child. But if you're, the reason we use fake names is because we just don't want to be discovered as the enemy, because, you know, I have friends who are horrible about this whole situation. I mean, no longer friends, you know, you kind of find out who your true friends are. Uh, I had a friend who um, contacted my son without my knowledge, you know, cheerleading him on. So mm -hmm. you, you're very picky about who you tell, who you want to know, because you can't really trust that anybody will actually support you or be on your side. Like you're, you're shocked that parents are supporting the kid over you. Right. And you know, you think it's like if your kid had cancer, everybody would come to your aid, but this people avoid you. Um, they think, you know, it was your parenting. They blame all these things that you, never thought were possible and mm -hmm. you know the government the the state the the schools the professionals the doctors everyone is against you and vilifies you that you're a terrible person because you're not going along with this right it's so like we, I mean, in a minefield it's like living in a minefield you don't know when the bomb's mm -hmm. going to go off whether it's going to be your family or your friends or your physician you just don't know Right. And it's traumatizing. I'll, I'll just put it right out there. It's yeah. traumatizing. As we deal with this tender topic um, and the impact that it has on moms and dads and families, let alone the children themselves, you're, you're the ones that you love the most, the ones that you would do anything to protect and guide and, you know, raise, um, the culture has changed so quickly. It's become so aggressive, uh, the trans movement. I think parents are catching up with this. Uh, unfortunately, it, it, the, the, the plan is to separate the kids from the parents. The plan is to move quickly. The plan is uh, the parents not to know. Um, obviously, that's why both of you decided to participate in this book and write this book, because hearing people's stories help other parents figure this out better. Would you talk about the book, Parents with Inconvenient Truth About Trans, and really how this came uh, to fruition? Maybe we could start with you, Josie. Well, yeah, you should, okay. because Josie, I, I did right. not, I, I know about the book, but I'm not, the, Josie's the architect. She is, so right. She's, she's a pa parent. I'm a parent. Yeah. <laughs> so right. what, what happened was um, there was so much talk about um, Girls, Abigail Schreier wrote a book about um, inconvenient truths and was talking about girls, only girls. But there was a whole bunch of us parents of boys and we're, we were saying, well, what about us? So okay. another mom parent of a boy. So we started writing articles trying to get published. So then we, from those articles, we decided to create a sub stack and we were publishing our pieces. We started with two a week and then 
it somehow caught on because obviously there was a need. We had mm -hmm. no expectation and we just were trying to get the word out about boys. And, and then we started asking other parents to write their story and they would. And then we started asking girl parents that we knew um, to write their stories because we're all in these parent underground groups. So we kind of all know each other. Um, we do zooms together and, um, support, so, support one another. Yeah. We support one another. And so all of a sudden, all these parents were sending me their stories. Wow. And, um, so we started publishing and we got so many stories that we start publishing five days a week. And we now have over 500 stories on our sub stack. Right. So from this sub stack, we, um, put together, um, one of a, one parent started said, Let, we should make this into a book. And so she emailed a couple of publishers and our publisher Pitchstone emailed back and said, let's do this. So we put together the book and thought we could maybe reach more people rather than just through the online sub stack. And that's what we did. And so far, so good. Uh, we're trying to reach parents who before they're, so they have knowledge of this could happen to their kid right. because everyone thinks, oh, it wouldn't happen to my kid because they're right. so secure with who they are, but it happens overnight. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want regular parents to know that any kid could fall into this trap. Yeah. Maybe I'll run right over here or over to D I should say, because her daughter had a, um, a rapid onset gender this happened super quick with your daughter. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was the story um, with your daughter? Well, um, so she's, you know, she's Chinese in a predominantly white conservative community and um, ended up leaving a small Christian grammar school for an extraordinary large high school with over 2,500 students. Very, mm -hmm. very, very few Asians. Um, and she faced a lot of racism. I found out after the fact mm -hmm. that people were calling her, you know, crazy little Asian, crazy, angry Asian. And she's a very um, gentle soul. And so she's very talented, you know, artistic, but very empathic and compassionate. And um, she, had, she was starting to have trouble making friends. But in freshman year, at the very beginning, she had about four or five really nice girls. One of them was quirky. But the others were nice. They would do sleepovers. Um, and then in the spring of 2019, at the tail end of her freshman year, um, that friendship sort of, the friendship circle sort of dwindled, leaving her with the quirky kid. Mm -hmm. And um, at the beginning of the summer, um, as I said, she was she was a boy crazy bikini clad girl. And right. You had no, was, you didn't see any of this coming clearly. No. And in fact, you know, when we went shopping for bathing suits for spring break, I had a I had an ixnay a whole bunch of them because I thought they were a little too risque. Right. So you know, she was out there trying them on, and um, and then so we had this friend over um, to our our we belong to a club, and so we said, you know, if you, she wants to come to the pool, that's nice. And she didn't have a bathing suit. She wore wakeboarding shorts and like sleeveless tank tops, and it looked like. And I didn't know what the word binder was, but I thought that's a pretty tight shirt on underneath. Now I realized in my stupidity, it was a binder. Mm -hmm. And so in the beginning, you know, so, and at the same time, as the school year winds down, we heard that there was a pride, some kind of pride event at the high school, which I was pretty surprised by. And um, she came home to dinner one night and announced that she was bisexual. And that was in front of her nine-year-old sister. And I, <laughs> my little one goes, what's bisexual? Right, I said, of well, course. You, know, you like boys and girls. And then my little one goes, well, then I'm bisexual. I said, okay, let's have this conversation offline. Right. Um, and so we just let it drop. But then a few weeks later, she was les lesbian. And I thought, you haven't even had sex. How do you know? <laughs> Right. Oh, maybe I'm ignorant here, but anyway, um, we just said, well, you know, love is love. And we just thought well, not, not make a big deal out of this. Okay? okay. But then the next thing, you know, she was trans just like between the end of May into July by August, mm -hmm. beginning of August, she was just 
trans identified and no more bathing suit at the pool. She wore a heavy black hoodie and a pair of shorts. And that was the new uniform for the pool. Um, so clearly this girl had extraordinary influence, influence over her. Right. And that girl, I found out after the fact, that girl had already been in that rabbit hole for a year. It started when she was in middle school. And so, um, so she was really entrenched. She's a very bright girl. Her parents believe she's on the spectrum, but she, you know, she's very charismatic about it. She actually convinced a cousin that she's trans. And she also tried to convince her younger brother that he was a girl. And I found this out after the fact from her mother. So she's very charismatic about it. Um, now, by the beginning of sophomore year, our daughter was having panic attacks, anxiety. So we thought, okay, what's going on here? And we took her um, to a therapist that we thought understood what we were talking about. And it turns out she was affirming her. And then mm -hmm. out of the blue, she made me take my kid to the suicide unit. She was having suicidal ideation. Um, I was blessed in that the psychiatrist who examined her the day after said, this is clearly an adoptee issue. She's having an identity crisis. And that's what I was calling it and said, you know, because one of the things my daughter did is when she's with a different friend, she, she dresses like them. She can almost mimic their voices and their laughter. Mm, very so impressionable. Try, trying on identities, you know, and let's trying face it, identities. you're halfway across the world from where you were born. Mm -hmm. And you don't know who you sound like, who you look like, who you walk like who you think like, and it's got to be just such a, a devastating realization. But yeah. in the meantime, my daughter now convinced herself that she's born in the wrong body. And, and it, I could see her head exploding at the thought of that. Um, so we fired that therapist because she wasn't doing us any good. We hired another one. And by January 2020, when my daughter was um, not getting better, I hacked into her phone. And I, what I downloaded was just shocking to me. In the meantime, I am trying to figure out what is this thing that she's going through? And right. Google, I mean, research is in my DNA. I'm an attorney for over 30 <laughs> years. That's what I've been doing. And I, I couldn't believe the fact that, you know, am I the only one going through this? And what do you call this? And um, and then when I, when I went to her phone and I saw that friend and she were, the friend was sharing lesbian porn with her and uh, lesbian terminology and the foul language. And, and uh, it was just unbelievable. Filling your mind with all of this. Yeah. And then my daughter also reinvented her whole history. My mother forces me to wear corsets. My mother forces me to wear dresses, stuff that was so bizarre and untrue. Mm -hmm. And at the end, the girl said, well, it's a good thing all the moms have a safe house for you. And that blew me away. Mm. because I thought was child protective services now going to show up at my house and take my kids out of here because my daughter is lying. And um, I contacted the mother of that girl. And I let her know she, she, I told her what I saw, how disturbing it was. And she sure. didn't even want to see it. I had it on a thumb drive and I said, I, I'd happy to share it to you. And she said, no, I don't want to see it. So then we, then the therapist, second therapist said, I can't help your daughter. I just can't. And she had been affirming her all along. So thank you. So we hired a third one and she affirmed her on the first visit, even though she said she wasn't going to do it. Well, by then I, I saw Lisa Littman studying in March of 2020 and just, just everything made sense. Right. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. And then I found Sasha Ayad who introduced me to Stella O'Malley. That's how I met Josie ultimately. But mm -hmm. um, we found a psychologist who's not affirming, who treats this cohort and who uh, would not to commit to saying whether she's trans or not from the beginning, was very honest in saying, listen, I, ha I may have to use that male name to develop a rapport. I'm not affirming her. I said, okay. And shortly thereafter, she um, diagnosed her with pre-adoption trauma. Okay. Um, and then subsequently said, your daughter's not transgender. She's reading from a script. It's all scripted in her answers. Right. And then last year, she diagnosed her with borderline personality disorder, which comes from the pre-adoption trauma. So, so here you've got a whole situation that your daughter's going through and supposedly changing to trans is going to fix all this or give her a new sense of an identity that's going to make her be in a happy place and better. And this is the lie that's being fed to these young girls and young boys. They change their identity their, their, you know, their sexual identity, their gender, and all of a sudden everything's goes away. Was this the same situation with you, Josie, with your son? Same, but different. Um, I mean, 
Yes. Um, so my son was all boy athlete and his dream was to play high school, um, baseball and he made the team and his soft, he got cut. So, um, it all, everything so it was sort of a perfect storm because he decided he stopped hanging out with his friends from middle school and he was only hanging out with the baseball players. And then once he got cut, he was just sort of on his own. And he had a friend from Boy Scouts. So he started only hanging around this boy from Boy Scouts mm. who decided he was transgender and has since transitioned. And so we knew nothing until like the day he told us we were completely in the dark. We were completely blindsided and shocked. And we tried to figure out what was going on. Um, we later learned that in seventh grade that a trans person went to his school and did an assembly. And, um, I think it could have planted the seed, but I think he was very vulnerable and he's a little socially awkward. Um, he's very, a uh, very smart kid. So, you know, what you might say a nerd, um, but, and has so much potential and he just fell into this rabbit hole. And he, and because of the school being so progressive here where I live, um, one of his teachers, you know, completely cheerleaded him along. In fact, mm -hmm. this man even tried to help him find housing out of our house. So all the adults in his life were affirming, were affirming and celebrating. And mm -hmm. we were the only ones pushing back. Mm -hmm. So and they're told that if your parents don't go along with this, you need to get rid of them. You know, like there's no contact with, so that's exactly what he did. And, um, you know, we're worried about him. We're scared to death and we don't know how to reach him because until he figures it out himself, which apparently they eventually do, but we don't know how long that'll take. But in the meantime, they're ruining their lives. Right. Mm -hmm. And the and worry it, as a parent. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I can imagine. Um, I think it's so offensive because children are so impressionable and just so innocent that um, it's really just infuriating when someone comes alongside them and tries to parent them and change them, knowing that they may just be in a, a very tender spot, uh, whether it's puberty or just awkward or on a spectrum or whatever that is, you know, that's just, it's really sad. Would you mind talking about, cause I know our moms that are listening, this is, it's affecting all of us. I, I, if it's not in your family, it's someone that, you know, right. This is where we're at right now in the culture. You have a term called terp. Um, and I'd like to talk about that because this is what moms need to be. They need to know, um, about what's happening and they need to be educated. Could you tell us about that? Maybe T? Well, or, yeah, it's, it's a one? trans exclusionary radical feminist, T E R, TERF. And um, it was intended are, to. Are you saying TERF or TERP? TERP. Trans yeah, educated, a... rash, the rational parents. Oh, right. okay. Yes. I think you did a play off of this, but exactly. But, I, but I'd like to know about the TERPs because I think that is what every parent would like to be trans educated, rational parent, if they're dealing with something like this in their family, with their friends or in their community, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's what we hope for, for everybody. So well, what is of, that? We sort of came up with a term just because there's this term called TERFs, which is trans, trans what is it, D? Trans exclusionary radical feminist. Okay, and that was considered to be a slur. Um, I've embraced it. <laughs> and okay. so we came up with a term just to um, say, this is what parents are. Um, and uh, we put it on our site, the um, pit parent site. And it was just to try and educate parents to know that any kid can get indoctrinated no matter how secure they were in their, their sexuality or, you know, like 
D had an all girl. I had an all boy. And, and just overnight they, they, sw- it was like got switched and there's so much in the schools you know, now we hear that, you know, in kindergarten, they're teaching them, you might not be a boy or a girl and mm-hmm. all pick your pronouns. Stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's confusing. Kids are so vulnerable. And if anything happens, any kind of trauma, like getting cut from a, a sports team, that was your dream. You can find it. it you can find hor- horrible things to get sucked into. Mm-hmm about your own person, like something you thought could never happen. And that's why it's so dangerous. It's basically a cult we feel. Oh, it's definitely a cult. Mm -hmm. And, and we actually consulted a cult expert a while back um, because we thought if we had to take the nuclear option, (laughs) that gentleman might be the guy to help us out. Mm. You know, that's how desperate it drives you to, to really think outside the box. You know, while you're trying to love and connect with your child, what else can I do to save my child from harming herself or himself? Right. And it's, it's, you know, some, some of my friends commented to my husband, you know, your wife is just obsessed with this. And I find that so insulting because if my kid did have cancer, as, as Josie pointed out, you would understand right. that I don't sleep. Right. Right. And it's the same thing with this. I have had nightmares of my daughter removing her breasts and I wake up and I just, I, I'm, and I had a dream the other night that she, she convinced her sister that she was a boy. So I had two of them. I mean, that's the thing. It just infiltrates. So you're trying to be rational mm-hmm. and yet you're gripped by this overwhelming fear. And right. I think Dr. Miriam Grossman put it correctly mm-hmm. when she called it disenfranchised grief because you've lost your child, but the child's still here and society mm-hmm. doesn't recognize that grief and society blames you for that. Mm-hmm. That's your fault. You screwed this up. And so here you are, you're fighting the medical industrial complex, you're fighting the schools, you you know, you're fighting your family, you're fighting your friends, institutions, you know, you worry about the colleges. I mean, it's 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 overwhelming under siege. I'm under siege. Right. It is. It's they're bold and they're brazen and it is just really an attack on our kids identity. And if your children do not feel comfortable who they are, life is going to be bad in every arena, let alone their gender. I mean, they're Mm -hmm. just, and they just come after them. How how is your daughter, Dee? I didn't get a chance to have you. Thank you. She has not um, medicalized or done any surgeries. We, we, we set the boundaries. Um, She's been in therapy with this doctor since April of 2020. Okay. Uh, Since the BPD diagnosis, we have noticed a vast improvement in her emotional regulation because that's a big problem with BPD. She is still entrenched. The doctor said she is still entrenched in the ideology. And, you know, when I met with her a couple of months ago, I told her, among other things, I'm working with detransitioners, helping them find legal representation. And I said, what I've noticed with the detransitioners is there seems to be a four to eight year trajectory before they come out of it. I said, so my daughter's been at this for four years. I'm handing you a crystal ball. I won't hold you to it, but what are your, what's your prognosis? And she said, she's going to be in it for another three or four years. Hmm. And she said, she will come out of it gradually. And I asked her, when you treat this cohort, what are your outcomes? And she said, 90% come out of it. Yeah, I've heard that And the the cult expert said the same thing. 90% of people in cults come out of it. But the struggle is, how do you, how do you keep her from hurting herself? How are they coming out of it? gone through surgeries, irreversible drugs, Yeah, Yeah. right? That that's the thing, you know, we've had Dr. Grossman on the podcast too, and it's not a pause on puberty, all of the ramifications from all of the decisions that they make, they may be sterile. They may never have children. I mean, these are big decisions that they make at such a tender age without parental involvement and with a group of people pushing an agenda. What should we say here to parents um, about the lies they have to be careful of? Or I guess really both of you would say, you've got to watch immediately who your children are hanging with um, ahead of the game with uh, any new changes, anything. So I'd love for you to give us to the mom some advice um, to be cautious of. Yeah. You better figure out 
take keep that phone from them as long as you can. Yeah. Keep it from them. And if you have to give them the phone, then you know there are there are ways to block their ability to access the internet. We um late the game, but we install parental controls with uh Orbi Circle Plus. It allows you to regulate how much time they're spending. It tells you in real time what are they looking at if they spend more than five minutes. I mean, that was the big mistake. And we also had like our youngest one, she knows she has no expectation of privacy. <laughs> we just like, no, you know, she doesn't like what her sister is doing. She does. This is my, my youngest is the kid is going to scream the emperor's naked. Mm -hmm. But I think that was really important because when I downloaded, when I got into her iPhone and I saw what was being shared with her, mm -hmm. I was Tumblr and Reddit and the porn and all of that for, for a 15 year old mind, you know, it was poison. Right. So I would, that would be my first thing. Keep them. No up expectation of privacy. I like that term. And yeah. that's what we have to do as parents, right? We have to, and I, you know, I've kept the phone away from my kids and social media, you know, whole thing. And we just really have to know that we are in the driver's seat. It's not, it's very hard, you know, to hold that line, but that's what we've got to do. Um, and really, um, watch out for this and, just so sorry that this happened to your kids. Yeah, and I also oh. drafted a social media contract. Mm. But I had them both signed it. Mm. Well, and the other thing you could do is discuss with them that you will always be a boy or you will always yes. be a girl and make it clear to them that your teachers aren't always right. And if the teacher wants to keep a secret, don't trust them. I mean, you have to just plant this seed over and over again. Yeah. And I think it's helpful to whoever your kids are playing with, get to know those parents and get to know, make sure you know those parents and make sure you're on the same page with all this so that they're not keeping secrets from them, mm -hmm. from you, it, which is what happens to a lot of pa parents is the other, the friend parent goes along with this and you don't have any idea and you need to get in the school, get to know the teachers, um, and just keep trying to teach your kids critical, um, thinking, critical mm -hmm. thinking, right. You know, it used to be right back in the day, you would go over it with the kids. Hey, somebody pulls up and they say, Hey, I've got a puppy in the car. Hey, you want to go for ice cream? Hey, you want to take a walk, right? Stranger danger, stranger, all this stuff. Now look at fast forward, how much the things that we have to continually go over and practice with our kids and, and, you know, be the, the voice of reason, because it's not puppies and ice cream and somebody's going to take you in their car, which is horrible back then. But now it's like, somebody's going to actually take over your gender. Mm. Yeah. The boogeyman is in the computer. Yeah. And it's in everyone's home and in everyone's hand. But the other thing parents can do is they can get off the me the social media around their kids, get off the phone. I mean, you know, Pay you attention. have to emulate so that your kids aren't doing it. So if you're on your phone all the time, you know, texting and, you know, looking at Instagram, your kids are going to want to do that too. Right. So this is, this is, you know, and parents get sucked into the social media. It's an addiction. Yeah. So, you know, if you're not doing it, then you can say you have more leverage over your kid to not do it. But if you're doing it all the time, it's like, if you don't want your kid to drink or smoke and you're doing it all the time, it's hard to like say, well, I'm doing this, but you can't, you know, you have to set an example and the other because thing, it's, it's very dangerous. Right. And it's hard because schools are now, you know, my youngest has an iPad. That's how she gets, that's how she right. learns in school and does her homework. So the rule is mm -hmm. you don't take that thing in your room. You do it right in the kitchen where I can see you. Correct. I want to yeah. see what you're looking at. Right. I had my yeah. kids phone up at eight o'clock, no one in the bedrooms. And, you know, it's just, I think, I think parents and moms are understanding this so much more. Um, and it's just it's, it's a battlefield. It really is a big battlefield. What are um, some of the other things if, so if, if parents have not um, seen anything like this happening, um, is there something that they should always be looking for or how, how do you discuss this with children at a young age? The potential of it 
or the warning signs? What would you suggest to moms? What kind of conversation would you have with a child? And at what age? I guess it would be different for every every age, every child. I would child. start in kindergarten where they're being told they might not be a boy or a girl. And you could say, you know what? You will always be a, a girl, no yeah. matter if your teacher, your doctor, you know, sometimes um, they don't always know because that's what they're saying about the parents. Your parents don't always know best. So you have to turn that around and say, you know, sometimes your teacher doesn't know best. I will always be here for you. I will always love you. I will never lie to you. But some people do lie. You know, right. you just have to talk about that. Mm-hmm. Dee, what about advice to parents that maybe are in this situation currently? Their child has started to share uh, situations or stories or ideas of maybe being gay bisexual well, yeah. what do you tell I know, them because i made so many mistakes along the way. but yeah now you've you've got a wealth of wisdom though on this now because you've talked to moms all across the country about this well i think you have to reinforce with your child that you love them you love them no matter what there was a very good book that was recommended to me in by sasha ayad in um april of 2020 and it's called parents hold on to your kids mm. And it's about how children are becoming increasingly peer oriented and migrating away from the parent child relationship. And the author um, even talks about the fact that these, these children become parented by children and he calls them the the immature usurper. And that is exactly what happened in our house. She, we, the immature usurper took my daughter and schooled her on how to be trans. Mm -hmm. Um, It came at a good time in terms of recommendation for a book, because it was when COVID was just, you know, in full bloom. And he's got a section there called how to reclaim your kids. Mm. And I worked the program because my relationship with her was so bad at that time because of the phone and everything. It was toxic. It was absolutely toxic. And so she was kind of stuck at home with me during COVID, the lockdown, um, you know, depended upon me for her meals all right, or to drive her somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I used the tools in the book to try to reclaim her. And in Mm -hmm. three months, I got a hug. And that was just beautiful. I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, It's a lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work to do that. And I've had, I can't talk about the gender thing with her because, and I think every parent knows your child best. Okay. Sure. We can't do it because it devolves into just an explosion and uh, unhappiness and rancor. And so we just kind of backed off and we'll talk about other things, how, you know, talented she is, good grades, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. And then at one point in time, I did say to her, you know, I know you're mad at me and it's okay. I still love you no matter what. And one day you may say, I never want to see you again. I said, I'll love you even more. I'm going to love you no matter what. So Mm -hmm. if you can reinforce that, because what the cult expert explained to us is that when they come out of the cult, and we're seeing this with the detransitioners, the very community that love bombed them now hate bombs them in yes. a really malicious, malignant way. They and abandon so, them, don't they? They do. And they, so he said, your child needs to know she has a safe place to come home to. Mm. She needs to know there's a place for her of love. And he himself had been in a cult. And when he came out of it, He said, you know, the whole time I was in it, my father, I always felt like my father loved me. He didn't approve, but he loved me. And he said, I was able to come home and where I felt safe. So that's a big deal. So if you can avoid the arguments, because it was counterproductive here, Mm -hmm. um, some people can have conversations and they can sit down and get their kid to think. But I think my daughter's mental illness and and the pre-adoption trauma, you know, she just, it's hard for her to feel connected. And so we have to work on that. Understood. Josie, for you with your family um, and advice that you would give, I know all of you, both of your stories are so different, but yet the same. You love a child. You would do anything to protect and guide them and help them in their journey. So what would you say, Josie, too? And, and the other thing, I guess, too, we don't talk about this is just the effect that the entire family is brought into this situation. You're the younger daughter, the parents, the cousins, the friends. I mean, this becomes, this affects everyone when someone has this dramatic 
uh, identity change um, and, and just loving them through it. But Josie, your, your words of advice too to moms that would maybe be in this situation um, in their home. Well, I think what I did wrong was I took a hard line and said, we're not doing this. You're not trans. Um, and I set boundaries, but what I could have also have done is, um, given him had been more empathetic to what he was going through, but because of my mental health, hmm. I could seem to do that because I was so upset that I, maybe I wasn't giving him enough, you know, telling him, I love you no matter what but I don't agree with this. I mean, I did say that later, but I didn't do that early enough um, because I was so blindsided. uh, Yeah. And I just think you need to just hold on to that bomb and just reinforce you love them. And I thought we were doing that. I actually thought it was working, but I was wrong. So you think love will went out, but it, there are so many other obstacles, but other people have, who did what I did had great success. Their kids came out of it. So it's every kid is different and you have to kind of know your own kid. And I would just try and support them without affirming them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I think if, if you think there's any kind of, you know, most of these kids have some kind of comorbidity and you've got to really work hard and and it's 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 a sisyphean task in some cases but to find the right mental health professional to give you a diagnosis because if you can get to the root cause which is the most important such right the most important answer i've met a number of um detransitioners and they they have borderline personality disorder it's an identity crisis Mm -hmm. To give you an example, my daughter's self-portrait two years ago was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy with a square jaw, chiseled chin, and turned-up nose. That's never going to happen, okay? <laughs> it's never going to happen. Right. But that's the self-portrait. That's how, you know, they she sees herself when she transitions, and it's never going to happen. And it's it's you have to figure out what is they're in emotional distress. They're in excruciating yeah. emotional pain, and you have to figure out what it is. Why is that? And, um, you know, it's important, especially for adoptive parents. Um, one of the, I also am affiliated with our duty. It's a parent support group international and I'm onboarding parents all the time. And I'm, there's a good number of, um, mothers of Chinese daughters mm. and, um, think back to when that child was put into your arms and, and what was that experience like? Because in our case, ours was 13 months old. She weighed only 15 pounds. She couldn't cry. She couldn't hold a bottle. She certainly couldn't crawl. And when I brought her home, the doctor who examined her said, she's failure to drive. You got to her just in time. She said, I don't think she would have lasted another month. So I, and then her toddler years were night terrors and flashbacks. And we just thought, you know, it was our first kid. We didn't know. Um, We should have intervened earlier. No, Knowing what I know now, I wish I had intervened early. My second child, she screamed when they put her in my arms. That's a very healthy reaction. She doesn't know who I am, you know? She had bonded with somebody that, you know, spent the four hours driving from the orphanage, and then she was thrown into the stranger's arms. But now she's extremely connected to me. But that, she had a healthy reaction. Mm. So I don't know what they did to my child. But, um, you know, that's something to think about. And and I think Boston Children's Hospital reported a disproportionate number of adoptees identifying as trans. And our adoption agency, when I asked them, they said a, an extraordinary number of Chinese adoptees have transitioned. Right. And this is probably something that no one has seen in decades before because it wasn't being pushed. It wasn't so, no. Right. No. Thank you. The agenda yeah, I just was not so say- big. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I just want to say about um, therapy, it's not for everyone because apparent, uh, there, there are some therapists who will cause like a triangulation where the parents are the bad guy, sure. they're the hero, 
and the kid is the victim. And, mm. and a lot of therapy pushes victim mentality. These kids all think they're victims. Mm. And so if I find would avoid right. therapy or I would only do family therapy mm -hmm. um, because you need to be a part of it. And, Correct. and I would also never let your child alone with a doctor I, alone with anybody alone, you know, I, because you don't know that, that so, so many times I've heard parents stories where the therapist says, Oh yeah, I don't belong, believe in all this. And that's not what they're doing. They're mm -hmm. going a lot. They're telling the kid, yes, I support you. Yes. And telling the parents something else. Yeah. And you know, the kid is alone with the pediatrician and the pediatrician will say, now, what gender do you identify with? And you don't know that they've asked that question and it just plants seeds. Sure so does. you just have to say, nope, I'm not leaving the room. Mm -hmm. Do not let your kid alone with any adult because you don't know where they're coming from. Right. And they are, they're and doing these surveys in the schools. They're doing them at the doctor's office. They're doing them everywhere, dynamiting our kids. And someone said to me, why do you have such a hard time with somebody choosing um, confused or... Uh, not sure. I might like, because that checks something in their heart. You know, that check mark, when you say that, that begins a questions in your mind. And it's all, you know, it, it, it's all tragic. But when I talk to the both of you, my heart just goes out for you as a, as a mom. And I just be praying for your family. And thank you for speaking out. Thank you for sharing your stories. And we just pray that, you know, your kids um, come home. And, you know, you'll be there. That's what's the most beautiful thing is that you as moms are there to hug them and help them get through this uh, when that time comes. So we're praying for you. Thank you very Thank much. You. And I encourage the parents listening to this to, to buy that pit book. It really is. It'll give you such a, a better idea of what happened, how parents got there. And, yes. and, and I think it'll make people more aware. Sure it will. Once you, once you read the stories and it crystallizes in your mind, you start to look around and you say, wait a minute, I don't know about this. I don't know about this kid, you know? Um, right. So I highly recommend. And where, where do we get the book? Parents with, tr parents with truth about trans. I'm saying that correct, right? Parents with, yeah. With truth Parents about with inconvenient truths. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry because on here I'm saying, oh, I must have, uh, uh, you know, shortened it down. So I want to make sure we get the title correctly and where you can get it at ladies. Mm -hmm. So it's parents with inconvenient truths about trans tales from the home front yes. in the fight to save our children. And it's on Amazon, but there's four fake books out there that say summary of oh. it's the, the well, cover. Well, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The cover is a house. It's by Josie a and Dina S. So, don't get it confused with the fake books. Okay. Well, we'll put up the correct one. We'll put up the link. We'll make sure that moms know exactly where to get this information. And, and, and Amazon and bar some Barnes and Nobles. Okay. And if any parents listening to this are finding themselves in the rabbit hole or close to being in the rabbit hole, mm -hmm. um, we have a parent group, ourduty.group. And also there's a website called Genspect. G E N S P E C T, which provides all kinds of resources for parents um, and educating and, and what you should tell the schools and what you should be aware of. So the more aware you are, the better you'll be able to fend this off early. Perfect. Thank Great you. Great advice. Thank you, ladies. God Thanks, bless Jen. you. And we so appreciate you. And we're going to get this out to all of our mamas. All because, right. God bless uh, all you. the mamas out there. Yeah. Yes. There's a sisterhood with all of us, right? We <laughs> yeah. all want to just help one another and just give everybody the tools, the resources and yep. the information that they need to raise kids in this culture, because it is crazy. Mm -hmm. But mamas are fighting back and they're going to do everything that they can to protect and guide and love their kids. So thank you, mamas. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a story. Thanks again to these moms that are sharing their stories and helping other mothers all across the country with this incredible issue that is affecting families more than we know. So thank you again, ladies. I appreciate that. I do want to mention a couple of the websites that uh, Dee and Josie shared with us. Again, it's genspect.org, ourduty.group, parents of 
rogdkids.com and pit, P-I-T-T dot substack dot com. We're putting all of that information again up on the screen for video. And again, moms, that information is for you. Share that with whoever needs to hear it. Okay. Alrighty, moms, what we do here at the end of the show is we always want to drive everybody to our website and let you know that we have incredible information. We have a gender confusion booklet um, that has a lot of this information and other podcasts related to this discussion and this topic. So please stop by Moms for America, check out our information. I also let everybody know that you can sign up for our newsletter. This is how we communicate with you at momsforamerica.us. Check out all our information, sign up for the newsletter and get engaged with moms just like us all across the country. We're here to help and support you. Also, we always talk about our cottage meetings. That is our signature program. Check that out when you stop by our website. There are 12 lessons that will inspire and educate you about America's history, the principles of liberty, so you can teach them to your children, in your home, in your community. We say this every week, moms, you are the heartbeat of your home. You are the heartbeat of America. That's why we are so um, thrilled to be helping you as a mama and in your journey through motherhood right in your home there. Um, Every week we have great podcasts, information, resources, and webinars. Again, we are here to help and support you. So please join us next week for another informative episode on our podcast. Please share this podcast with your friends far and wide. And mamas, let's keep changing our world one home at a time. Talk to you soon.